continuing our series in Ephesians. In Ephesians, there it is there, Ephesians, God's blueprint for the glorious church, which funnily enough, I never came up with that idea at all, but Sam, uh, Sam Willis, where are you Sam? Uh, Sam really uh, had this on his heart, but we connected with it immediately. And, uh, and so if you weren't here last Sunday, can I ask you, plead with you to, to get Sam's introduction on this. It was outstanding. And I would just recommend everybody to listen to that, please. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful introduction to this series. And just to underline as well, again, maybe, that the church even now has something inherently glorious about it. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says to the church in Corinth, which was a church full of issues and problems and icky sins, he says at one point, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And then he goes on to say this, he goes on to say, he says, look, God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Which is amazing if you think about it, that this sickly church in Corinth, and maybe many of us would think, no, I don't want to be part of that. Paul looks on them, he says, no, 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 sacred. There is something sacred going on here. There's something glorious going on here. And that's true of us too. And that's true. Something sacred is going on as we gather and as we be church community together, something beyond ourselves. And I know it doesn't always feel that way. You know, <laughs> here we are in this, in this atmosphere-less gym. You know, there's nothing here to drum up anything this morning. There's nothing here. It's just the gym. But as much personality sometimes as a, as a gent's toilet, I sometimes think. <laughs> Look, just saying, just saying. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cold in the winter when we get shoved out here and uh, we struggle through, don't we? And I'm sorry, there's no coffee today either. Yeah, no coffee, sorry. Nevertheless, there is something sacred, Paul would say, about this being the church. And we can sometimes not look our best. You could, you know, I hear you say, well, speak for yourself, Pete. But, or feel our best, a bit grouchy at times. Hey, there is something sacred here among us because he is here among us. And there is something glorious here because of the calling we have. You see, if you think about it, what is the calling of the church? Well, Paul frames it for us a few verses earlier in chapter 1. He says this, he says, that God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ. In other words, there'll come a day when all things will be brought under his headship. And so ultimately, it doesn't matter who becomes the next president of the United States or, or what Putin will do or won't do in the Ukraine or, or what the coalition government will achieve or not achieve in the first hundred days. It's not about that. There is a greater plan at work. There is a greater policy being put in place. And it's this, that one day all things will be brought under one head even Christ, all right? And that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? That's where history is going. And how will we get there? How will, it will be, how will it be done? Well, Ephesians will teach us that it will be done through the church. It'll be done through the church, a church that displays his grace, his mercy, his holiness, his character, his power, and his glory to the world. Amen? Now, the challenge we have as believers is to believe that. Because <laughs> as I said earlier, the local church isn't always an impressive bunch. It can be a bit disappointing at times. We can let each other down, make mistakes, we fail and in Paul's day, look, they're no different. There's nothing romantic about first century Israel. Oh, thank you, dear. And so in this first chapter, Paul is wanting us to regain, and really it's his burden behind the letter to the Ephesians, to regain a sense of, of, of the glorious church, a sense of its majesty and sacredness in the hands of God. And so in this chapter, Paul, chapter 1, 
Paul begins to pray. And I always find that so interesting because Paul is this great apostle and he's a great teacher. And if he was teaching around here, we'd go for miles to hear him teach. He is the apostle. And even now, the letters that he wrote are still affecting so many lives. But it's interesting, there are some things that he, even he can't teach, he can only pray for. Why? Well, because God has to break in by his spirit and reveal them to us. They are spiritually given. Teaching is fine as far as it goes, but God has to break in by his spirit and reveal them to his people as his people pray. And so Paul prays. He prays like this. Chapter 1, I pray, he says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Then he goes on to break it down. He says this, I, I, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened or opened. Why? Well, well in order that you may know, and really it's three things, in order that, that you may know, number one, the hope to which he has called you, Number two, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And number three, his incomparably great power for us who believe. And you think, wow, that's what he's praying for. That's what he's asking God to do for these churches, to reveal these three things deep into their hearts. Because he knows the truth, that if the church gets hold of this, gets convinced of this, they'll be changed. They'll be transformed. They'll emerge more and more as a glorious expression of God upon the earth. That's what he knows. And they'll continue to bring all things under the headship of Christ. So I just want to pause on each of these three things with a prayer at the end that God would begin to work them into us as a local church. That's where we're going to go this morning. So, so we'll kind of aim for that. We'll just touch on these three things briefly. All right, the first one is this, the hope to which he's called us. Now, I know these things are a sermon in themselves, but but briefly and simply, what this means is this, is that you and I, we are called ultimately heavenwards, right? We're all, those who've given their lives to Jesus, folks, we're on our way to glory. Right, we're on our way to heaven. Uh, Paul refers to this in Philippians 3 as the upward or the heavenly call. Right, we're all going to heaven. In other words, we're on our way ultimately. That's our calling. We will live with Jesus forever in a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells, where sin is gone, where every tear is wiped from our eyes. No more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away. That is where we're going. That's the ultimate hope to which he's called us. And when it says hope, look, that's not just a vague hope. It's not like, well, I hope the Hurricanes will win the championship this year. Now, that is a vain hope. (laughs) Sorry, I just don't have any faith for that. No, 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 no. Hope here in the New Testament, it means firm expectation. And the prayer here is that we will be so certain of this coming future that it begins to affect us now and how we live. That's what Paul's praying for. Kind of reminds me of uh, a little girl I know. Uh, I'm a granddad. Uh, and when she was about four or five years old, uh, Ellie Mae up in Auckland, that's where they live now, up in Auckland, uh, and they were about to fly down to spend a two weeks holiday with us down here. And uh, it was funny because two weeks before they were due to fly out, Ali Mae packed her suitcase. And uh, she packed it with her little goods and her nice little Barbie dolls and all the things that were most precious to her. She puts them in the suitcase and says to her mum, nags her mum daily because Stacy told us, you know, we're going today, we're going today. Stacy would say, no, 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 not yet, it's another week, it's another week, it's another week, and our... no, going today. It was like she'd already packed and gone. She'd already left. She's living in the expectation of what was to come. Her whole focus, her whole behavior was geared towards that, wasn't interested in what was going on around her so much. 
she had packed and gone. And Paul is simply praying here that we will be so gripped by what is to come, so excited by our heavenly calling, new heaven and new earth, that it will affect how we live now. I remember years ago, Julie and I, we were uh, visiting a very old friend of ours who only had weeks to, to, to live. She was dying, but we hadn't seen her for a very long time. And uh, when the afternoon came, we were going to drop by their house. I was a bit nervous because I thought, I don't know, I don't know what she'll look like, and I don't know what I'll say. I haven't seen her for such a long time. And so we arrived at her house and sat down in their living room. And what blew me away was that her face just radiated a love for Jesus. It was like she radiated heaven. It was, it, I was blown away by this. I can remember thinking, you're already there. And part of me thought, what a shame that we don't all live like that now. Because in the light of eternity, folks, we are on the brink. This life will be over just like that compared to the length of eternity. We're all on the very edge. And there is a sense that Paul is praying that we might live that way. Live as if we're already there. A sense of that. Because let me tell you that a church that lives that way will be a church that is obsessed with the king and his coming kingdom. No longer distracted by the superficiality of the world around it. You know, the bigger car, the better house, the higher pay grade, the nicer fashion. Instead, abandoned to the purposes of God. Look, we need to see a church like that emerge, don't we? Because we're living in a world that it absolutely denies there is anything beyond this life at all. And that shouts through every advert, every TV program, every film, every claim on social media that this life is it and there is no other and this is where you make your own heaven. No, we're called to be different, living with one foot in the age to come, testifying to its truth by the way that we live. I don't know how many of you have heard of this guy's story before, Watchman Nee, one of my great heroes of the faith. And uh, you can still read his books today. Watchman Nee was uh, in the Chinese church in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Great teacher and pastor. And uh, he's, he gave his life to just writing good books and preaching to these scattered Chinese believers in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Well, if you know the story, in 1948, the communist government came to power in China. In 1952, Watchman Nee was put behind bars uh, and never came out. He's still a rel relatively young man at the time. In 1952, he's in prison behind bars simply because he would not recant his faith. Cut off from friends, family. In 1970, his wife, she died. He wasn't able to attend a funeral even. After 18, 19 years of being separated. Because he would not recant his faith. In 1972, Watchman Nee himself died still behind bars. And it says that when they went to clean his cell out afterwards, they, they turned his pillow over and written in his own scrawl was this statement here. Christ is the Son of God who died for the redemption of sinners and resurrected after three days. This is the greatest truth in the universe. I die because of my belief in Christ. Watch my name. Wonderful statement. And a few weeks before that, he wrote to his sister, he wrote this, that through all that he had suffered, he said this, I maintain my joy. See, this is a guy convinced of the hope to which he was called. Already has one foot in heaven. And on the back of his death and ministry, a vast underground church in China began to grow and to move and is shaking the earth even today. And some would look on that church and say, what a glorious church. What a glorious church. Paul saying to the Ephesians, I'm praying for you that by his spirit he'll come upon you and open your eyes and you'll be excited by this eternal hope to which he's called you. And I don't know about you, but I find myself praying, God, come upon us by your Holy Spirit. Save us out of mediocrity. 
Save us out of same old, same old. Save us out of religiosity or obsession with personalities. Make us a church like that. That's the first thing. Then the second thing he asked for is this. He asked for this. He says, uh, he says uh, I pray that your eyes may be open so that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The second thing he prays for. Now there's some argument about what this actually means, but I don't think it's that difficult. I think it's simply saying that God is committed to forming a people that he will happily claim as his own inheritance. Right, it's a bit like this. If, if you knew that you stood to inherit an old house down the street, right? A plot of land, an old house, empty, down the street, you knew it was going to be yours, what would you do about that? I know for me, I know what I would do. I would take an interest in it. I would peer at it every day. I would protect it. I would look after it. And if no one was living in there, I'd begin to tinker with it. I begin to work on it. I begin to build it into the place I'd want to inherit. In fact, I make it so that it reflected my taste and my personality because it's my inheritance and I'm committed to building this thing. Well, in the case of the church here, it's like God is saying, I'm committed to building these saints together into a building that will be rich and glorious like me. Reflecting my love, my mercy, my holiness, my character, and with a heart to gather more and more souls for my son. And Paul is saying to the local church here, look, I'm praying that you will understand that deep within. And we need to sometimes, because as I said earlier, the local church as it is doesn't always appear impressively glorious. It's still like an empty building at the end of the street can be disappointing at times. We can let each other down. Some of you I know are here today and maybe you felt very disappointed by your own experience of church, wherever that may be, and we can carry the scars for years. And we make mistakes and we fall out with each other. Paul says, no, God is committed to making something glorious of you, invested with a glorious message and called to be reflectors of it. And as I look at the church across the landscape of this country, you know, it doesn't take you long to look at weakness and, and stumbling and churches are falling and fragmenting. There's something in me that wants to shout, guys, God is about a great thing. God is committed to building something for his inheritance. And I've got to just say this morning, it's funny seeing old friends here, but I've been in church leadership full time really since I was 22 years old and I'm now in my 60s. I know I don't look like it. I know, I know that. And so in that time I have seen the good and I have seen the bad and I've seen the very ugly. But I still love saying to people when they come among us, I love the church. I love the church. I love the church because I know he's committed to building something glorious that will bring all things under the headship of Christ and he's committed to it beyond my ability. And there are some days when I'm not. He always is committed to building his inheritance. Amen? And that brings me to the last thing that Paul prays for, and it's this. I pray, he says, that you may know the incomparably great power for them that believe. Wow. Incomparably great power. What does that even look like? Well, Paul tells us. He says this. That power, he says... In fact, let's all read this verse, shall we? Let's all read the verse. Let's enter the audience participation. Let's read the verse. That power is the same as the mighty strength. Come on, come on, let's go for it. Let's all read it. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And just think about that. <laughs> just think about that. You know, the power to raise a person from the dead is beyond us. We don't have that power in all of science. So the power talked about here is already beyond anything we know. But then he goes on, because this power is not only great enough to raise a person from the dead, but to raise that person to the right hand of the Father 
above every rule, authority, and power in this age and in the one to come. In other words, it's so great you can't get your head around it. It is ultimate power. And what's it for, this power? Well, it's for them that believe. It's for the church. To enable it to become this people who will be for the display of his glory. And that's why next week when we pray, what are we doing? We are tapping into that power. When we gather in his presence like we've done this morning, what are we doing? We're tapping into that power. We sense he is the way maker. He's the one who breaks through. When we're reading the scriptures and proclaiming the gospel and, and granting forgiveness and overcoming sin, we're tapping into that power. Folks, we have access to all we need to emerge as a glorious church in our day, according to the scriptures. And Paul says, I, I, I pray that you might understand that deep within, because a tragedy comes when the church forgets that and starts to tap into other things than God. Whether it's fashion, or the trends, or the entertainment, or the personalities. Folks, when the pressure comes, such churches fall, or they lose their way. Folks, you want to know what an emerging church, glorious church, looks like? Well, it's this. It's a people who, number one, actually know the hope to which they're called. They've already breathing the air of heaven, already have their bags packed. They're not being deceived by the lie that this age is all that there is, and they're obsessed with the king and his coming kingdom. Number two, there are people who are confident as God's inheritance that God is committed to building them after his likeness. The trouble is when we start trying to build the church after our own, and then we hit the head, then we, then we get stuck. Because God is about building something after his likeness. And there are people who are bold because they know the weight of God's power is behind them at their elbow and freely accessible. You know, now and then we come across churches like that. I think the Chinese church, from what I've read, is probably close to that. Many stories that have come out of that over the years. Well, the Iranian church... The fastest growing church in the world right now is in Iran. As many are coming to faith, meeting in homes or basements, cellars, little groups. It's a glorious church. Guys, I don't want to miss out. So, Fano, as Paul, or alongside Paul, we need to pray. I want to put it out there today. Look, if you feel deep down that you yearn to see a church like that emerge in our day, if you have a yearning for that, if you look around and think, God, you surely died for more than this. If that's you, maybe you're aware in your own life that you've lost a bit of an edge and you've got a little bit sucked into the lie of the age that this is where it's all at. And it's left you high and dry. And you're thinking, I thought there was more to this. If that's you this morning, I want to just invite you to stand with me. Because I'm saying, God, come upon me. And do what Paul says to do, which is to pray. Can't teach it. Can't do a salesmanship job on you. Can't make you see. No, this has to be people poor in spirit crying out to God for more. So I just wonder whether we could just stand as we close. Let's just stand, shall we? And if you're visiting, please feel free to sit or stand. I don't want to impose anything on anybody. But at the same time, I don't want you to miss the opportunity. Because Jesus died for more than this. And if you look at your own life and the highs and the lows, the triumphs and the disappointments, if you're anything like me, you'd be thinking, Jesus, you died for more than this. You died to put more in me than this. It's your mercy. It's your grace we've been singing about. By your grace, you're inviting me into more. I don't want to settle for crumbs that fall from the table when you died to give me a meal. When you died that I might genuinely lay hold of you and reflect you to a dying world. 
So maybe if that's you, if you're finding yourself dry, maybe you're finding yourself thinking, oh, there's more. Or maybe there's just a dissatisfaction deep in your soul. God, the church has more than this. If that's you, you might want to just, I don't know, put your hands out maybe if it suits you. But either way, open your heart. Because we want to pray an inspired prayer because it's in the Bible. We want to pray, God, please open the eyes of our hearts. Lord Jesus, please enlighten our hearts by the Spirit. Lord, please, we don't want to stay where we are. We sense there is more to come. We sense the world needs to see the real deal. Not the hype, but the authentic expression of the people of God who love Jesus. Who know they're living within an inch of glory. Who know, Lord God, that they're on the brink of eternity. Who know, Lord, that we are packing our suitcases for heaven, not building for the earth. Holy Spirit, please come upon us. Please open the eyes of our understanding that we might be convinced of the hope to which you've called us, the glorious inheritance in the saints, the wonder of the church, and the incomparably great power that is right here as we gather, that you might see your church come through in these days. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Please forget about the person next to you. Please come to Jesus yourself. Only you know your history. Only you know the scars that you carry. Only you know the yearnings that you have. Lord Jesus, please come. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill our sails, Lord. Propel us forward. Bring healing where it's needed. Bring you fire where it's been missing. Bring refreshment to souls that are dry. For this is your church, Lord. Please take us on in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 I know that we're supposed to be putting chairs together in a moment, but I, I, I just think, can we just wait a bit longer? And if you're feeling particularly challenged over this this morning, you want to draw a line under what's happened in the past, and you want to drip, turn a page for a new day, if that's you this morning, then we love the opportunity to pray for you specifically. Please don't leave the hall in the same state that you came in if it was dry and you were yearning for more. Maybe on the left here, if that's you, that your lights out, I, I want to turn a new page, I am crying out for more, then just come over to my left. We'll make a space. We'll just spend a moment, a few minutes maybe, just crying out to God together. If that's you, then I'll invite you just to hang out, spend a bit of time down there, and we'll pray for God to move upon us in greater measure. Come, Holy Spirit.